Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, don't have too many people here yet. Um, so I don't have a particular agenda today. So I'm hoping um, we'll uh, see if there's questions from people or not. Uh, I have one or two things I can go over. So mostly, <coughs> as usual for a Wednesday, I was expecting to talk about the assignment that's due on Friday. So assignment three, if people have questions on that or I'm working on it. I did start on assignment three on Monday a little bit. Um, or, and we can talk about, um, you know, about uh, pointers and um, dynamic memory allocation and uh, yeah, the, the topics for this week, if, if uh, anybody wanted to ask some questions about those things. So, um, So I might kind of repeat a few things that I shared last time, maybe. So um, one thing I did show people was that, um, or, or remind people, um, all of the code examples are um, available in our class repository. So if, if you have the class repository open um, at the root of it, um, there's an examples directory um, and you should find all the code examples in there for um, all of our lecture videos for the week. So let's close all these off here. So for example, for this week, um, um, we're on week three here. So we had both the examples about the pointers and also the example about the dynamic memory. So as I was talking a little bit about on Monday, um, so what you have to do for the assignment three, you know, is, is similar to kind of a little bit to some of the things that we did on the second video for this week. So that was certainly a good video to watch uh, before you do the assignment if you haven't or if you, if you didn't quite know how to get started on the assignment. Um, because for the dynamic uh, memory video, we created, um, we had an example of a class for a list, um, but um, we're dynamically allocating the memory, the array, to hold the list items, right? So one of the, one of the shortcomings that we had for your assignment two last week for the, the set um, class that you guys created the member functions for was um, it was hard-coded. So it, it had um, exactly 100 items. Uh, I'll bring that back up again to kind of remind you what I'm talking about here. So if you're paying attention to the set, um, that you implemented, there was a, an array that you used to hold your set items, an array of integers, uh, but it was defined in the, the header for the class, in the declaration for the class, to be an array of this max set size. So there was actually an upper limit of 100 items that you could have in the set. Right? And we didn't do anything for error checking or anything uh, for assignment two. So we didn't check if you were adding the 101st item that uh, you know you got an error message or something like that. It would just happily add in items past the end of this array, which would probably cause your program to crash eventually if you, if you kept adding things past you know greater than 101 to your sets. So so that, that's kind of a limitation of, of that. So um, so back to this week. So so using dynamic memory allocation and and, and to be able to use dynamically allocated memory, you have to know how to use pointers. That's kind of why we study these um, at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, in this example we had for the second video, um, there was a list, but instead of having a fixed size for the list, a fixed upper limit, uh, we, we um, allow the list to dynamically grow in size um, so that, um, it can always get bigger as needed, right? Um, 
and again, I talked a little bit about this on Monday. So um, th this is a good function to make certain that you understand. So that all that kind of magic happens in the append item um, for this example in our second video from this week, right? So quickly kind of to go back over that again. Um, so instead of having an array of integers, you've got an integer pointer called item. That's, um, and if you watch the, the first video uh, for this week, you know though that when you dynamically allocate some memory, you can dynamically allocate a single, enough to hold one single integer, but you can, you can instead dynamically allocate memory to hold a block of integers, so, so 10 or 100 or however many you want, right? Uh, but in both cases, you'll get a pointer back, whether you just allocate a single item or whether you allocate an array of items, right? So for our list type, we're actually allocating an array of items, and we're remembering the pointer. We're putting it, that we're remembering that pointer um, and, and saving it in this item member variable, right? But then once we've allocated the memory, we can treat item as, as if it's an array, just like we treated the set item from your assignment two, so, so, so it's really just an array. So uh, to, to show how that kind of works, um, or to kind of repeat what we talked about in our second video, um, a pinned item, basically all this stuff in the if statement only happens if the, the array is filled up. So, so if your size is bigger than the allocation size, then it's going to add, you know, that means that your array that you have allocated is full. Um, and we're going to allocate some new memory to hold the new item that you're trying to add, okay? So originally, this kind of works two different ways. So there's really two situations to standard. So initially, when the array is, uh, when, when you first create a class of this list type, um, your size is zero. So it's initially empty, right? Um, and you can see that if you look in the constructor here. So initially the size and the alloc size are both zero um, and we set the array uh, called item to point to null, right? Um, so initially, I mean, zero is gonna be equal to zero. So we'll actually go in here and it will actually dynamically allocate, right? So what happens the first time is um, the, the new alloc size is set to alloc size plus that allocation increment. This is just a globally defined constant, which is set to 10 um, at the top here. So the, the new alloc size would be zero plus 10 the first time or 10. And then here is the dynamic memory allocation, right? So by saying new int, so again, if you just wanted a single item, you could do something like that. So that would just give you enough room to hold a single integer, right? But um, we don't often allocate dynamically single just enough room to hold a single item. So, I mean, almost always when you're allocating memory, you're either allocating like a block of memory, like an array of items, or maybe dynamically allocating an instance of a class or a structure or something like that. Um, so yeah, anyway, in, in this case, like when new alloc size is 10, this will actually allocate a block of memory that's big enough to hold 10 integers. And that pointer to that block of memory. So remember, uh, pointers, you should think of those as memory addresses, right? So when you do um, a dynamic allocation, it actually returns the memory address of the block of memory that was allocated for you. Um, and we save that memory address in the pointer here, this integer pointer variable, new item, okay? Um, but yeah, then the other kind of important thing though, so once you do that though, um, I mean, this is an integer pointer, but after you've after you've dynamically allocated some memory uh, that you could use, now you can use new item as an array, like like any other array that you're used to um, up to this point, right? So here we show. Um, so so what happens um, the the second time when when. So, so, so jump in here, we're, we're doing this copy here um, because, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain that, right? So the very first time you call add item, size and alloc size are zero. So it will allocate an array of integers to be able to hold 10 integers. 
but you don't have any items, uh, so nothing's going to be copied because there's no current item. So, so um, the, the size is still zero, so nothing will get copied. And then what we do down here at the end is we kind of forget about um, um, the, the original item. So by assigning um, our pointer variable item to this new item that we um, dynamically allocated, now our, our item is going to be pointing to this new block that we just allocated, right? And, and we can safely get rid of um, that um, um, item here. And we do that before we repoint this by, by doing a delete on item here. Okay? So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense except for the second. So the, the second item that you add, uh, so, so after you do this once, the alloc size is now going to be 10, right? So the, 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 the second item and the third item and, and the fourth item up to the ninth item that you add, um, you're never going to be inside of this if statement. It'll just skip over that uh, because you've got enough room to add the, the first through the tenth items into your array. But after that point, when, when size is 10, that means that we've got 10 items in the array. That that's zero to nine. So at that point, when size is 10, it's going to be equal to the current alloc size, which is 10. So, so at that point, then we're going to go into this again to allocate, um, you know, to, to grow our memory allocation. So at that point, we would take um, a new alloc size of 10 plus 10, so we'd have 20. And this would dynamically allocate an array to be able to hold 20 integers that second time. And then here is where you actually need the copy. So we, we can't forget about the items that we have, the first 10 items that we had put into our original allocation that are pointed to by item currently. So we have to copy those 10 items um, out of the item into our new block of memory, new item, right? So this just copies those. And then this frees up that the, the old item, the, 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 the first one that we allocate of size 10, so that, that frees up that memory. Should all every every new should always have a corresponding delete, um, so that you're not leaking memory, um, as I talked a little bit about in our videos this week. Um, um, and then at the end here, uh, we kind of we don't since we've we've deleted the old items, we don't need it anymore, um, and we just reset items to be that new item um, that we just allocated. And then from then on we're going to be using, you know, item is pointing to that new block at 20 that we allocated the second time. So. All right. So anyway, I mean, you know, it's important to understand this um, because maybe I'll go ahead and jump to assignment three unless anybody has some questions here. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of repeating a lot from Monday. So if you joined in on Monday, I talked about most all the same stuff already. But in assignment three, um, so initially, uh, so, so we're, we're trying to build this large integer class for assignment three. Um, so kind of to step back on that, um, open up the assignment description here. Um, so basically we're trying to create a class here to represent integers. So if you know the way that, that types work in a programming language like C or C++, there, there's, there's the, the simple or the built-in integer type. So we can use that, but it has a limitation. So the, the built-in integer um, uses a uses 32 bits, right? So, so it's a finite size. So what it means is that you can only represent sign integers from you know up to positive, so like 2 billion, 147 million, 836,647. So that's you can't really represent uh, any integers bigger than that. With a standard 32-bit um, signed in, and, and you can it's it's signed, so you can actually also represent negative one down to negative, basically the same thing negative negative two million two billion one hundred forty-seven million. Um, all right, but but if you need uh, integers that are bigger in magnitude than that, um, you can't use a regular int. You could use a 64-bit int. Um, 
and that expands your magnitude quite a bit, but still there's a limitation. Even if you're using a 64-bit int or 128-bit int, select for a 60, so for the 32-bit in, um, integer, um, this is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is like 10 digits, basically. So you can represent up to integers up to about 10 digits. If you use like a 64-bit int, um, I think it's like approximately about 60 digits or so. So you'd say that might be too big, but um, it's like, or maybe more like 20 or 30 digits. But but um, still, there, there's a kind of an upper limit on the magnitude. So sometimes you really need to be able to do calculations with integers that are really huge, right? Much bigger than you could represent in a 32 or a 64 bit in, like, like with hundreds of digits, let's say. So lots of things in cryptography, um, you need to do things like you, you want to calculate the um, 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 uh, prime, large prime numbers. Um, and uh, you want to calculate the the product of two really large prime numbers, and and and, and uh, for for different cryptographic reasons, right? And those numbers tend to be thousands, tens of thousands, very large numbers of digits. They they don't fit into like these standard int types. So so you need data types um, like we're doing in this assignment three here to do stuff with those. So. So, um, you know, that was kind of an overview of, of, of kind of what we're doing for this large integer. So what you have to do for the actual tasks, um, so I, I step you through this. So, um, um, you know, starting with, you do have to create a constructor, um, and, and uh, maybe I'll go over that again. And then we create a couple of other, you have to implement a couple of other member fun functions, like uh, this max digits and digit at place and so on. But the, 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 this all leaves, all these, we, we, we use and reuse these member functions to make it easy to implement and add member functions. So that if we, we can take two large integers, um, and if you call add on with, with two large integers, it will add them together and give you the result, right? So, and, and as you can imagine, you know, for to make this class fully functional, we would have to actually complete that off. So we'd have to also implement add, subtract, multiply, divide, um, you know, maybe throw in like um, uh, a raise into a power, so a large integer raised to another power, that kind of thing. Um, Um, so let's take a look at it. So your very first task, um, and, and I showed a little bit about this before, is that you have to add a constructor, okay? So I want to make certain, I won't show you doing that constructor, but um, let me talk about it a little bit, make certain everybody understands. So I give you, in the starting code for assignment three, I actually give you two constructors and um, a destructor. Uh, in fact, um, last time I didn't show you the implementation, but I, I showed you kind of the, um, the the signature for the function that you have to create here, right? So, so, um, so yeah, actually when you guys start, this was from Monday, when you guys start, you only have two constructors and the destructor um, like this in your code, okay? So let's, oh, and, and um, you know, this large integer class basically just has, um, you can ignore the ID, you won't have to do anything with the ID, but it has two other values which are similar to what, to, to things that you used in the set and also in the list type um, example code from this week. So we really are just keeping a dynamically allocated array of digits. That's what the digits um, integer pointer is here. Um, and then the other integer is just the number of digits, or basically the size of this array, okay? So the default constructor um, just implements, um, creates a large integer that has zero as the value. So, so to represent zero as a value, uh, we can represent that with a single digit. So, so we, we um, create the number of digits to be one, and we dynamically allocate an array but this array only has enough size to hold one integer, okay? Um, and then we set that value. So here, now that we've dynamically allocated it, that the, the, we've got enough room to hold one integer and we, we set the value of that one integer to zero, 
So, so the default constructor basically constructs a representation of zero if you um, don't initialize your large integer to anything. Right. So the second one um, is more typical of what you would do. So let's look at the um, tests as well here. Um, and maybe I'll uncomment the first one here. So, so this is how you would start off. Um, on this assignment and um, actually um, don't know if I did this in the assignment description, but the first test here, the first test case here is really only um, testing um, the default constructor um, and this um, uh, and this other construct that I give you, right? So uh, this first test actually, if you uncomment it, should um, compile and run. So if I save that um, and build it, it should be able to build and it should run, it should be able to pass these tests here. So, um, oh, oh no, that's right. So the, actually the first step you have to do before you do the constructor is you do have to provide the two string. So yeah, I did, I did skip over that. So, um, um, the, those first tests are just testing that you get a two string, um, function implemented correctly, okay? Uh, let me come back to that. So, but, but yeah, you have to kind of do that first, but to, to understand how to do two string correctly, it, it, it is useful to understand this large integer and the constructor here. So let's, uh, so the, um, the intention here, like, um, so again, if you just um, construct a large integer, Using the default constructor, you should get an integer that represents zero, a large integer that represents zero. And then if you convert it using two string, it should re just return back the single digit zero as, as, the, as what the value is of the large integer, right? Uh, if you, now the, the second constructor takes an integer, uh, a regular 32-bit integer um, as, a, as the parameter. So notice when you create an instance of a class, uh, first, it's perfectly legal, you know, we talked a little bit about this last week when we talked about class, and so it's perfectly legal to have overloaded constructors um, and, and overloaded member functions, right? So we have two constructors here, and actually you're going to add a third one, but we have one constructor that doesn't take any parameters as input, and that's the one that's called here. And we've got this constructor that just takes a single integer as input, and that's the one that's going to be called in this test case when we construct the second large integer here, right? So here, you know, we, we want the, the large integer to represent the value, um, you know, 12,345. So, so this has five digits, um, and the ones digits, or the 10 to the power of zero, is a five. And then the tens digit, which is 10 to the power of one, is a four, right? And then the hundreds digits are 10 to the power of two. You know, hopefully you know kind of your decimal and maybe converting between decimal and binary and things like that. But, um, but, but yeah, each of these represents a different power of 10, right? 10 to the power of zero, 10 to the power of one, 10 to the power of two are the hundreds digits. And then the two is our thousandth digits, 10 to the power of three. And then one is our 10,000 digits or 10 to the power of four, right? So what the uh, large integer constructor that I have does is it um, takes a regular 32-bit integer and represents that as an array of digits, where in the array, the, the value index zero should be a five. So first of all, we have to dynamically allocate an array that's big enough to hold five digits um, if we're initializing our large integer like that. So that's what we do first here. So this, this first calculation, um, by taking the log and adding one to that, that's gonna, that, that will, from the, the, this integer value, one, two, three, four, five, that, that will come off that it, it needs five um, digits there. That's all this calculation does. And notice that num digits um, is, um, you know, the, the, the member variable here. So we're initializing our member variable to be the number of digits that we have to hold in our large integer, which is five on this test case that I'm working through here for you, right? Um, 
So once we figure out that we need five digits, we dynamically allocate enough room to hold five digits and we save that, that pointer, that memory, block of memory that we just allocated into our digits pointer, which become, which you can also think of as an array of integers, our, our array of digits here, right? Um, yeah, then once, once we do that, we have to, uh, we have to get these digits actually into our array. So again, we want a five to be put into digits at index zero, and then a four into digits at index one and so on, right? And that, that's what this loop is doing here. So by doing a mod, so if you take one, two, three, four, five, and you do mod 10, that's a remainder. So it's like dividing by 10 and finding the remainder. So, so one, two, three, four, five, mod 10 gives you a remainder of five. And then we put that digit, this is the first time through the loop. So we put that digit five into the digits array at index zero, okay? And then by doing a, uh, an integer division by five, that chops off the last digit. So one, two, three, four, five divided by 10 uh, ends up a, a result of one, two, three, four point five. But since this is an integer division, it just chops off the decimal part. So we end up with one, two, three, four as our value. Right. And then we do that again. So the second through time through the loop, we're trying to get our digit at index one, which is the 10 to the power of one place, right? So, you know, now our value is one, two, three, four. And when you do the mod, um, that you end up with a remainder four, and we put that into the, um, the, the, the 10 to the power of one digit, and then we divide by 10, okay? So, so anyway, you know, you should um, walk through this calculation, make certain that you understand it yourself. Uh, but uh, this basically has the result to convert from a standard 32-bit built-in integer type into this array of digits, okay? And the other thing, the reason why I wanted to look at this first is, you know, you should understand, though, that, that the ones digit, or the 10 to the power of zero, is in index zero of the array, right? And, and then the tens digit is in the, the index one, the hundreds digit is an index two and so on. So it makes sense if you think of the, of the index as the power um, for that digit in our large integer here, right? But what that means then, if you, if you come back to the, the very first task you're supposed to do is implement the two string. So you actually have to go through backwards. So to get, um, uh, for example, to get, if, if these are our digits in our array, that means that the digits at index zero is a zero, the digits at index one is a nine and so on, and the digit at index um, uh, 10, there's 10 digits here, the, ten, the digit at index 10, um, at, or sorry, at index nine, uh, so there's 10 digits, uh, so this is going to be 10 to the ninth power here. But, but yeah, the, the digit index nine is a one, right? So anyway, to, to get the string in the right order, you actually have to, to, to iterate through it in reverse. So you have to start at index nine and put that into your string first, assuming you're using like an O string object, um, like I suggested that you do in the um, assignment description, right? Um, a string, if you're using a string stream, which is probably what you really should do, use, use a string stream here. But if you're using a string stream, um, you, you probably have to go through your digits array in reverse order. So you want to start off at your last digit, you know, you know index nine, put the one into your string stream, and then go to, to index eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, right? And, and put those in in reverse order. If you put those in in reverse order, you'll get them out in the correct order in your string. So your largest um, digit power um, on the left side of your string down to your, your ones power, your 10 to the zero at, at the right hand side of the string, all right? So again, if anybody has questions, you know, feel free to type them out or um, shout them out um, if you want to clarify anything while we're doing stuff here. So. But, but yeah, that should give you kind of a hint on what you would have to do with two string here. And that's actually your first task. So um, to get um, these, this first set of tests to, to pass, I mean, I've already given you the implementation of the constructors, 
but you do need to get the string to be returning, you know, to be constructing a string using a string stream, and then returning that um, so that you get the expected string representation when you initialize these um, with the default constructor or the integer constructor. Okay. Um, so maybe to just give you a hint on that. So, you know, again, I, another thing, you know, that I've seen from assignment one, assignment two, I always see for students in this class, I mean, you really need to learn, people really need to learn how to program incrementally, okay? So, you know, um, um, you shouldn't be uncommenting and working on any member method or any test if you don't have all the tests passing um, uh, in, in test above that. So you really should not be working on any of these other test cases until you get your two string to at least pass these three first tests, right? And at the moment, since I don't have an implementation of two string, it's not actually even building, right? So when I try to compile, um, well, we just get the error here that, that my large integer type doesn't have the two string, right? So, you know, you should always uncomment and try and build and then uh, my suggestion is that you always just put in the, the the member function to actually get it to build, but put in like a stub, right? So, um, so here, if you read the assignment description, you're supposed to have a member function, or or you can look at um, you know the the test case here. Um, you know, you have to have a member function called to string T O S T R I N G that doesn't take anything as input and it returns, uh, you, you can't tell, um, and you can only tell kind of implicitly. So it Im implies though that it's returning a string that can be compared to a string literal, right? So, and, and I described this in the assignment um, description. You should be using C++ string objects uh, to represent strings. So don't use arrays of character. We might talk about that later on or you might have run into using character arrays to represent strings like in your programming one or programming two so uh, but when at all possible you really should use the string type if you're doing c plus plus programming so our um, two string um, this is kind of our function um, signature you know no input parameters just returns a string and if we wanted to get it to compile over in our .cpp file, we have to have uh, that function, but instead of a semicolon, we have to have a function body. Um, and in this case, uh, since this is a member of a class, it does have the additional constraint that you have to specify using this large integer colon colon. So all of these member functions you're supposed to be adding for this assignment are gonna be members of your large integer class. So this, this, this is the syntax in C++ for specifying this. So this is not just a regular function, it's a member function of the large integer class, so large integer colon colon, right? And uh, we could just put in a string, so, um, or we could just put in a stub so I just could just return a string literal, right? So this would allow me, for example, this should allow me to compile. Um, and um, since that's what my first test is expecting, it should allow me to compile and actually pass the first test here, right? Let's check that out. So let's try to build. So as usual though, it'll take a long time to rebuild my tests. Um, but, um, but I'm pretty certain unless, I'm missing something, that's enough to compile and run and run these first three tests. Um, and it'll pass the first one, but it'll fail the next two. So. And then to, to continue on, to get you completely started on two string. Um, so what you really need to do instead of, of course, you can't just hard code in a value. You need to have a loop in here and um, use a string stream. Um, So like you'll build up a string stream, but, but you'll, you'll want to have a loop that iterates through uh, your digits, but in reverse order. So instead of going from zero up to the number of digits, you need to go from the number of digits minus one 
and decrement down to zero. Um, and then, yeah, and then inside of that loop, uh, e e you want to send each one of those digits into your output stream. Um, this is similar to the string method that you did for the assignment last week. So, so um, if, you, if you did the way I suggest that you do it. So use a, uh, is it output string? Uh, uh, you might have to include, um, you might have to include the, uh, the string stream. Um, I don't know, we do have it. So you can see, um, back to this, so you can see that, that built, um, and we can run the tests. Um, so it should run, uh, oh, oh, shoot, it rebuilt. Um, so it's, it's trying to build the um, um, changes that I had in here. Let me, let me take that back out again. Let me go back. So if we're just returning that stub, so here it didn't have to recompile the, um, the, the test, so it built much quicker. So, and then we can run our tests. So it should run those tests, um, um, but it's failing some of them. So in particular, it's failing um, the, one, the one at 38 here, but, but it does pass this one because we hard code that in there, so. Um, and then you need a, uh, um, <laughs> drawn a blank. So uh, I'm sure I have some examples of it, um, like uh, in your examples this week. Um, so like in our, um, So there were, you know, so again, there, there is an example of two string in the, the video, which is probably going to be pretty similar. Um, so um, in particular, um, O string stream. <laughs> I was drawing a blank on the name. So um, like I did, you're, you're going to be doing something similar to this, but you need to go in reverse order. Um, uh, instead of from zero up to the size, you need to go from, you know, the, the, the size of the number of digits down to zero um, here. So. so you should be able to have an O string stream, uh, which, which comes from the um, string stream library, which is being included for you already in the uh, large integer.hpp header file, right? And like I did um, on the video for this week, uh, o string stream is actually not a string. So to actually return a string, you have to call the dot string method. So, um, yeah, I don't think you can initialize an O string stream like that, but I could, I could initialize it like, like that. So, so yeah, now I'm kind of building up to getting two string implemented. Um, so now it'll, it'll still do the same thing. It should return a string representation hard coded to just be zero, but now we're using an O string stream. Um, so it still compiles and it still builds, but it's still failing those same two tests 38. Oh, yeah, that one. Of course, I could get it to pass second test by hard coding in that. Uh, but of course now it'll fail the first one instead. It only passed that one. But, but yeah, what I'm getting at those is always make certain that your code is compiling um, and running the tests, right? Um, if, if you ever get to a, a point where you have a compilation error, you should immediately stop, get it back to us compiling and running tests. You can only make progress, you know, real progress, um, um, if you can compile and run and, and see which test is passing and which is not. And, and also, as I kind of gave back as feedback um, on the, the first assignment, the second assignment especially, you really won't get any credit for your assignments um, if you hand in something that's not compiling and running the tests, okay? So uh, I, you, if, if you, um, 
even if you don't get very far on these assignments, but if, if you hand in something that compiles and runs and you did do some work, like, like you, I, I can tell that you at least worked on like the first task, right? So, so I'm saying it, it, you can always get something, turn in something that compiles and runs by doing no work because the assignments that I give you compile um, and run um, as they're given to you, right? So, so you always need to keep your project in the state of being able to compile and run. But as long as you, when you submit something to me for grading, if it compiles and runs and you did uh, try to get through, you know, task one or something, you'll probably get at least half of the points, you know, 50%. So that, that's kind of what I think of as the, the minimum threshold. You know, does it compile and run and you made an honest attempt at least to get started and, and you're doing something on the first task or two, right? And if you get that far, you'll get 50%. And then the more tasks you get, the, the higher above 50% you'll get. So. Um, all right, so anyway, yeah, so, you know, always make certain it compiles, and like I was saying, you know, it'll run now, but now um, it'll fail on this one and this one, so. So really, all you need for the two string is you need to get your loop in there to actually build a string instead of hard coding in um, a value there, so. Um, okay. Now, and then for the second task, um, and, and as I showed last time um, uh, on Monday, the, the second task is actually adding um, yet another constructor. Uh, let me go back to the tests here. So um, the second task um, is tested in the second unit test which I'll uncomment now, even though, you know, you shouldn't do that because I'm not really, I shouldn't be doing this because I'm not passing my first test yet. But, um, um, so you shouldn't go to this point until you get your two string method working. But once you have it working, then your um, task is to create a constructor, but a constructor that takes an array of digits instead of like a regular integer, right? So the constructor I gave you just takes a regular integer, like one, two, three, four, five. But here, the constructor that you're supposed to construct for task two takes an array of digits, so an array of integers, uh, and the first parameter is the number of digits um, in that. Okay. Well, and again, here notice that uh, it, when, if we can, if you do the constructor correctly and you call two string, so notice it, again it's reversed. Um, but that that'll happen from doing the reverse in your two string correctly, like I talked about. But you know your zeros. Um, digit is here at index zero, so that ends up being the last thing in the string. Then your ones digit, uh, or sorry, your tens digits, 10 to the one, um, is it in the, um, index one, that comes out second to last and so on. And, and, and your last digit um, is a two, and that really comes out first, right? Um, so here for this constructor, um, as I kind of gave on Monday, um, Um, your constructor looks something like this for your signature, right? So, so you're given a regular integer as the first parameter. Um, that's the, uh, the number of digits, like 10 in this case. And then you're given an array of integers as the second parameter. So, you know, again, this is a review from week one. If you, if you want to pass an array into um, a function, even into a, you know, constructor, like a member function like this, um, you say kind of the same thing, but you can you can indicate that it's an array of digits instead of a single integer by putting empty um, open and close um, braces there, right? So that's kind of what your signature looks like for the uh, step two task that you have to do. Um, and then, you know, as usual, make certain that you're always putting these uh, in the correct place in relationship to the function documentation I give. So your constructor should go under here under the documentation that describes this third constructor. Uh, and again, since this is a constructor, but it, it's a member of the large integer class, so, you know, um, so I, I like the, the constructors I gave you, you know, your signature is gonna be 
um, large integer colon colon large integer um, and then just the parameters so the parameters are different than the other two constructors that I gave you right? and then in here to kind of tell you the hint of, of what you need to do so so um, um, it'll be similar to the one that I gave you right but for one thing you don't have to calculate the number of digits right um, you're told how many digits you need to construct right so, so um, if, if we're going to pass an array with 10 digits you're told that the number of digits is 10 so, so you're given that right so, so you can just directly allocate your array of digits and then you need to copy these digits so your second parameter are the digits you need to copy these from this array into um, um, your um, digits array that um, you dynamically allocate here, okay? Yeah. So I was just gonna show here, um, I should be able to get this to compile and run um, because I added, uh, the implementation here, my implementation isn't complete. I'm not going to show you the complete implementation, but I'll do one thing. I'll initialize my member variable to be the number of digits that's passed in as a parameter, like that. Um, and I put the, uh, the, the signature for the constructor into my header file. So it should compile and actually run. I have to recompile the test because I uncommented um, the second block of tests here. So it'll take some time to recompile those. Um, but, but yeah, that should be enough of a, you know, of a um, stub um, for it to compile and run. Um, but um, of course, it, since it's not actually initializing the digits, um, it won't pass these tests either. Um, not to mention I haven't implemented them. I don't have a real implementation of two string either yet. So. Okay, so that was um, you know hopefully a, a, a good start on assignment three. I hope people you know um, either watching this after the fact or um, are, are with me right now. Um, hope most everybody starts before Wednesday, you know, before like these sessions on these assignments. Uh, I really think, of course, you do have the quiz that you have to get completed today by five, uh, but, but everybody really should at least look at the assignment description on Monday and, and get started on it on Tuesday. Um, and I would like to see more people come and ask questions about it then on, on Monday session and um, on Wednesday session, right? So. I might not always do quite so much on these unless I get people asking me questions and prompting me to, to show doing stuff. So, so anyway, yeah, that compiled and we should be able to run our test, but it'll be failing most of those tests that I uncommented since it's, since it's not really doing that constructor and since two string really isn't doing anything either. It's just returning back a hard coded value right now. So. All right, um, I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, I'll give kind of one last uh, chance to see if anybody has um, some questions. Uh, no? Okay. Uh, well, uh, in that case, I'm going to go ahead and end the session. So good luck. Ho hopefully everybody's making progress on your assignment three. Um, if, if you need to email me um, questions, please go ahead. Oh, kind of a, um, a little note on that. Please try and make certain that you put the, the class number and your section number in the class. So for this class, it's COSC 2336, um, section number either 01B or 02W. Put that in your email um, title, uh, plus also like, you know, some description like assignment three. That'll make it a lot easier for me to, um, and, and also feel free to, you know, send me your code. So, so you know, I, I really don't like screenshots. It's better, you know, to send me the code or send me a copy paste of the output you're seeing from your build or something like that. It's usually a lot easier to work with than a screenshot. So. 
Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the session, um, and I will see you guys uh, next time.